For this special edition of Spotlight on COVID for Refugee Week, I'm talking to Dr. Leone Anselms de Vries, Senior Lecturer in International Relations in the Department of War Studies, King's College London. One of Leone's areas of expertise is on migration and refugees. In particular, the relationship between the management of migration and migrants' struggles for mobility, refugee experiences of being on the move, and legal pathways to protection. Today, we're going to talk about the impact of COVID-19 on forced migration and what challenges vulnerable refugee populations might face as the disease continues to spread. So, Leone, welcome to uh, this edition of Spotlight on COVID. Um, can you tell me a little bit more about your research on refugees and migration? Yeah, thanks, Lizzie. I'm very happy to have this conversation with you today. Um, so, as you already mentioned, um, my research focuses on um, what people have called borderland Europe and the the misnamed European migration crisis, um, because it's not just European, um, and I don't think we should see migration as a crisis. Um, so I'm interested in the effects of migration management on people on the move. Um, and often migration management is, is very violent, uh, can be directly violent uh, on people, but also in terms of the kind of bordering policies um, that are being imposed, whether that's visa restrictions, whether that's actual physical border walls, whether that's te technological systems. So I'm interested in, in how does this affect people who are on the move in, um, in various conditions. Um, but I'm also very interested in, in, in thinking about people's struggles uh, for and experiences of uh, movement and, and displacement. In, in terms of COVID, the world has been fo focusing on the global disaster, that is the COVID-19 pandemic. Have we forgotten about the plight of refugees as we've turned inwards to manage the fallout in our own countries? On the one hand, yes, you know, there's been more of an inward focus, but on the other hand, actually, I think we've seen some positive um, highlights as well, actually, of, of, of the kind of things that migrants might be facing um, and the kind of, you know, direct and, and structural violence yes. that they are experiencing. Um, so there is there's some more positive attention as well. Having said that, um, I think focus has turned away again uh, from others in, in more marginalised situations and um, especially people that are not so visible, right? So these, these might be refugees, these might be asylum seekers. We can think about people in informal settlements, as I've already uh, spoken about, um, and I can I can say more about that later. We can think about people in migration attention as well, often very vulnerable, and of course in places like um, detention centres, a uh, virus can spread uh, quite easily. Now, the, the numbers have been reduced in, in migration attention in the UK, um, but there's still quite a few people uh, that are detained and also people that would be uh, very much at risk of the disease. Um, but we can also think about others in, in unstable housing conditions and, and more generally people that, and we see this often with asylum seekers and, and refugees, they might face um, isolation, right? And, and that might just not be picked up on. Yeah, so I was going to come on to that. How, because I personally haven't heard that much about um, the situation for refugees at the moment, how are they um, managing the spread of the disease in some of these very vulnerable, precarious um, communities? Yes, well, it's, I mean, it, it very varies. It varies very much depending on, on, on where you are. Um, you know, when we look at the UK as for detention centres, whether we look at in, informal settlements, but uh, so I've, I've mostly looked at um, informal settlements uh, in France, especially in northern France, and um, and as well as a bit um, elsewhere. So I can say a little bit, for instance, about uh, Lebanon as well. Um, so I think the first thing to say, especially in more informal spaces, that we don't really know, right, because we don't have a clear insight of what's happening. But uh, speaking to people that are on the ground uh, in northern France, um, so it must be said, I think the first thing that has to be said, that the conditions were already appalling. Um, mm -hmm. So this is what I've, and together with Marta Veland, I've called uh, the politics of exhaustion. So there is a real, the policies that are d designed then, policies around migration, are designed to make life as as difficult as possible for people that are there irregularly. Um, so that means, you know, evictions, um, that means people are often living in, you know, in, in tents, if they even get tents, because often they get slashed by the police and so on, right? So you see this kind of daily violence and also the violence of of being in, in very uncertain conditions for a long time and, and not know, knowing where you can go, not knowing what your status is and so on. So that that's the kind of basic condition, um, which which is, is quite appalling. Um, now, 
it must be said that during during the lockdown, and of course France had a very strict lockdown, um, there were some measures, there was some you know, accommodation that was offered, um, you know, there was some testing at some point and so on, and there was some food provision, um, but it was it was very much um, inadequate. And also, and, and this was quite extraordinary, they kept the, um, especially in Calais, but in Dunkirk as well, uh, they continued doing um, raids of, of these very informal spaces. And of course, that put people at risk, but also the police, the police unions were, were against us as well. But um, So we see people that are in very vulnerable conditions already when there is a global pandemic, when nobody's allowed to move if it's, if it's not uh, strictly necessary, we still see raids um, on these kind of camps. Um, so and there has been there have been ongoing struggles. So the these the, the sort of the two bigger camps that existed up to 2016 that were um, destroyed at that time. There's still people in that area. So for four years they've been in these, these very difficult um, conditions, and that has just continued. But also during that time there's been fights just for very getting basic necessities like you know water, food, sanitation, and so on. So there's some stuff that's being handed out, but you know some food's been handed out, but it's mostly sort of dried food, no hot foods anymore. Um, there were some water points installed, but there was only for a particular period. And then in Dunkirk, for instance, and they took them away again, so people don't even have access to um, clean drinking water and so on. Um, so yes, it's 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 very it's very difficult. So there's been there's been you know some provisions which is good. Uh, for instance, some provisions for people you know that can go to hospital. Though again, might be difficult to get onto a bus because then you know they might not allow migrants on the bus and so on. Um, and there have been some um, also provision, some accommodation for people that have COVID symptoms but are not that serious. But there have also been reports of people that, that do go for a little while and then leave that accommodation again because they don't feel safe. Um, I think one of the big problems there is that because there's so much violence in the area uh, on behalf of the authorities, um, that people are very afraid to trust um, the authorities. And if you know if police come and say, like, you know, we'll bring you to accommodation, and I say, well, I don't trust you. Um, so that's been that's been a real, a real issue. Yeah, oh, that's that sounds like a terrible situation. And I mean, we've seen um, in Europe, we've seen some scapegoating scapegoating of refugees. We had uh, Matteo Sal Salvini, um, the far right uh, Italian opposition leader, suggesting that refugee boats from Africa were a risk to Italians when Italy was fast becoming the epicenter of the virus, and there were few cases in in Africa. Mm -hmm. Donald Trump has been using the crisis to clamp down on migration into America. We've seen unprecedented steps taken across Europe in terms of mass scale closing of borders, um, which we'd never have thought would happen. Um, and the Guardian reported this week that asylum applications. Um, possibly as a result um, in Europe have fallen to the lowest levels for over a decade. So do we, is there, um, what's the impact of this, all of this on migration policy and systems and kind of coordination on these issues um, in the international community? Yeah, um, no, absolutely. I um, mean, and this is all, this is all very worrying, but unfortunately it's also nothing new. Um, so I think I would say that migration management, so the kind of sort of practices of, of, of regulating and imposing borders and so on, um, and managing people's mobility, um, these are these are designed to be violent in some way, right? They're designed to facilitate the facilitate movement of some people and and restricting the movement of others that are keeping them out. Um, and and that has come for a long time with a quite problematic narrative around migration and it, i think it has been toxic for a very long time um if we think about the european context if we think about the us as well but also there's a much longer history of this identification of migrants and refugees with disease and uncleanliness and danger and so on right so so these are things that that pop up historically um over and over again um, but of course, it must be said that the, the way in which this discourse is, is, has played out recently is, um, yeah, is, is absolutely very concerning. But having said that, thinking about broader migration management systems and policies and so on, um, I think that this, this, this narrative as well as practices actually um, that are really problematic go hand in hand with this idea of free movement in Europe. Right. So what we see from from the 1980s onward is that um, when we get the idea within Europe of, of of free movement, so through you know through Schengen, through the Schengen negotiations and agreements, but as well as sort of the European Union after that, 
um, we see that this, this idea of free movement in a particular kind of space for a particular kind of people goes hand in hand with the idea that then we need to create an external border and that we need to fortify that border to make sure that nobody else comes in, right? So free movement is inextricably linked to um, imposing a bordering system for so-called others. And at the same time, and this is back in the 1980s, we see that language being used already of these others as criminals and terrorists and so on. All right. Um, so thinking about the way in which the migration systems that we have today are being set up in our sort of free movement, um, we cannot separate that from um, uh, the the expansion of borders um, throughout throughout Europe and, and beyond as well. You know, these, these borders are also externalized into into places outside of Europe to people, keep people out, but also around a narrative that is really quite problematic and toxic. Um, so I think we need to, uh, rather than thinking, oh, this is a very problematic narrative that's coming up now and that's new, there's, there's a really long history and it's very closely related to our own ideas of free movement. So I think we need to interrogate you know, that whole system. Yes, absolutely. Well, the theme for Refugee Week this year is Imagine, and we've seen unimaginable actions taken by governments all around the world in response to the pandemic, forms of socialist policies being implemented, and for example, Britain. Um, and more recently, we've seen protesters demanding an end to forms of structural racism following the killing of George Floyd. Do you think this pandemic could bring about a fairer world where we better value and protect human life? Um, I'd really like to say yes, um, but I'm, I'm sceptical. Um, this is very much, I think, a moment of, of change, and we should take this up as a moment of change as well. Um, but these things are always sort of complex and, um, you know, and, and move in different directions at the same time. So I'm sceptical about just creating this fairer world, but I'm very keen to, to push for more social and racial justice, and I think that's what we really need to do. Um, so yes, this is certainly a moment of upheaval and change, and and, and hopefully we can take up that moment. Um, I think the Black Lives Matter movement is very important um, at the moment. Um, the issue of, of structural racism and other forms of racism is absolutely nothing new. Uh, people have been fighting for racial justice for a very long time as well. Um, but I think what is what it seems to be different at the moment, and, and I haven't seen so much before, and, and this includes me reflecting myself as well, um, is this acknowledgement that structural racism exists um, and has existed for a long time and that it, it permeates our societies and, and we really need to reflect on that and do something about this. And the question of white privilege and, 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 and whiteness as well um, has come up in a way that I think, or the kind of acknowledgement of it and understanding of it, I think is growing and I think that is very important. And also for me, thinking about my research, but also thinking about who I am and so on. Um, it's it's also, I think, a moment to really think about these relationships between the movement of people, um, violence and race in a way that some scholars have done uh, for decades in a fantastic way. But again, I think a lot of us, including myself, haven't done enough of that. Um, and I think there's, there's a moment to really think about that. Um, so, you know, we cannot understand, if we just think about Europe for a moment, we cannot understand our European history, our systems of thought, as well as our practices, without thinking about the forced migration of, of slavery and colonialism more generally, right? Um, and also we cannot understand the movement of people today and our conceptions of race, of justice and so on, without interrogating these kind of histories, as well as the way in which it plays out today. So the idea of coloniality, um, the colonial present, where I'm just thinking of something um, that happened in the past. And I think that has, and that should have real implications also for, for thinking about how we you know, lead our daily lives, what we do, what we reflect on and so on. So I think um, in that regard, this is a really important moment. Definitely. Um, and lastly, what can we do as individuals to help refugees at this time as we reflect on the immense challenges they face during Refugee Week? Um, yeah, that's I mean that's that's an important question as well. Um, I think, firstly, you know, if we going back to my answer to the previous question, if you haven't already done so, um, try and read up um, on you know on on the question of, of migration and and refugees, but also these interlinkages. Um, 
and, and ask questions about migration, imperialism, race, colonialism, um, and so on. Um, I think that's one thing, you know, that's a more general thing, I think, that we should all do. Um, support charities, there are, uh, there is still a lot of work going on, and there is actually, uh, as well as there is a lot of isolation of people and so on, there is, there is a lot of work going on by charities and people on the ground that still help out. Um, of, for refugees and whether that's you know if it's around issues of health or around isolation or just you know food and so on um so that you know i think that can be um that can be done as well um so you know you can support them financially you can see if you can get involved virtually um or otherwise and i think also in the uk context really thinking about the hostile environment more broadly and thinking about the hostile environment not something that the government does out there and that's problematic but something that's diffused throughout society that affects refugees but also um also others and really think about our own communities our own institutions our own organizations and how does it play out there or does it play out there and what can we do about it yeah that's that's fantastic thanks for joining us today thank you very much